Okay, so continuing on with this battle for integration role model thing. It can't be too hard to understand the, the problem. You right now in your life have various hats that you wear. Okay, you're a daughter, a son, a mother, a father, an uncle, a nephew, a niece, a grandma. Okay, I'm old enough to be a grandma, all right? And in addition to that, you're you. You have a job of some kind. You're a housewife, an accountant, a lawyer, a ballerina. And you wear that hat in addition to your relationship hats, to other people, you're a friend, a spouse, a lover. Okay, you have all these hats and we judge each other. We have expectations that go with these labels that we put on ourselves and we add more labels that are totally irrelevant like I'm black, I'm white, I'm male, I'm female, I'm Irish, I'm Jewish. And we put these labels on ourselves and accord them an importance in our identity. Well, it's really ridiculous because, hello, are all males alike? Not really. Are all females alike? No. Because you're Irish. What, you're just like all the other Irish? And we have stereotypes we assign, of course. Jewish stereotype, black stereotype, white stereotype, Chinese stereotype. And we're none of those things. So what we're doing with ourselves all day long, just before we even consider, I'm a Christian, stereotype, we're boxing ourselves into all of these little categories based on abstract ideas of what those terms mean. And every single case, what we say those terms mean, it never accords with reality, ever. What is black? The blacks are forever talking about being black. Now we've got this stupid movement called Black Lives Matter. Well, of course your life matters, but it's not because it's black that it matters. It's because it's your life. So why do you put black before life? See, this is the stupidity of it. Black lives matter. How about just lives matter? But they're making an issue of the blackness. And they're going to boycott the Academy Awards. Because you didn't, you didn't put up any blacks for Academy Awards. So you must be racist. Really? It couldn't possibly be because the people who were acting in those movies were really good. And they just happened to be white as a secondary thing. I mean, this is ridiculous. And what that ends up meaning is that humans, are their, their brains just aren't working. Okay? The real you is the content of what you say and think. Pro what was that? Proverbs 23, 6. That's the real you. God is not a color. God made you. And okay, the house you walk around in might have a color. It might have some kind of national origin. And it will be a gender. Whoop-de-doo. That's not you. I mean, do you... Well, of course, people do that, too. Do you judge yourself by what you own? You own your body. The body's not you. You own it. It's a thing. You're going to leave it. It's a temporary house. You're going to get a new body when you die. So how can you say you're black? Because when you die, that body with its black skin is going to go in the ground. So then you're not black. Your house that you walk around in might look what we call black. It's really very dark brown. But so what? The skin color is not a thought process. 
it's melanin. Black people have more melanin than white people. So, melanin doesn't think. Melanin is not a soul. If you try to create a culture out of a color, then you're dumber than a stump. And everybody does that. I don't even, you know, it, it bothered me when I was a kid. I used to get in fights because the white kids would say that it would use the n-word and i hated that i rem I, I really got in trouble because i was fighting in front of the principal's office with some big girl who used the n-word and the blacks that were at the school were cheering me on while i tried to fight her of course she was better than me but i'm the one that got punished okay i mean it's ridiculous it was ridiculous when i was what, how old was I then? 10, 11, 12. I was 12 years old then. It was ridiculous to me when I was 12. It should be ridiculous when you're 5. What's color? Color is not thought. Thought has no color. Thoughts inside your soul. Your soul has no color. Your soul has no body. God made it. It's immaterial, just like him. We, I will make the man and woman in my image. Well, if it's in your image, then the, the body you're in is not God's image. God's not a body. I mean, well, you have to leave out the Mormons because they're dumber than stumps. Okay. There's no image that's material to God. You see the problem? Okay, so now, you are a role model, and whatever you look like on the outside, whatever your outer relationships are, your job, your relationships with people, everybody's going to peg you, and categorize you, and stereotype you, and it's always going to be wrong. And the uh, really sad thing is you're going to do the same to them. When you think of the word accountant, there's an image in your mind about what that kind of person ought to be. When you think of attorney, or politician, or black, or Jewish, or Irish, or German, you got, you know, impressions, and they're all based on stereotypes. So people are doing that to you, and you're doing that to them, and we got a whole slew of really stupid stereotypes when it comes to our religions. Muslim, Christian, Baha'i, Catholic, Calvinist, Hindu, um, Shinto, you name it. We all got images in our mind. But the person to whom those images nominally apply might not be like that at all. Okay? So here you are, Christian, and everybody's got this expectation that's been carefully cultivated in the media of a good Christian is supposed to do work his buns off and be always very nice and talk nice and say nice things and all, you know, Pollyanna. And if you don't act like that, then you're not a Christian. Really? You realize Christ would not qualify under that definition. So, that's the first problem. Here you are, a role model, just because you're a Christian. And you're you, as well as being a Christian. Are you Christian first? Or you first? Answer, you're you first. You believe in Christ, you're saved. That's actually who you are. And you're being groomed by God for the eternal state. That's actually who you are. But nobody knows that. Because they don't know what the Bible says about it. They got their stereotype definition of Christian versus what you are. Just like people got their stereotype definition of Muslim and Arab and, you know, all the rest of it versus what you are. Female, male. 
So if you deviate from those stereotypes, and you will, we all do, then somebody's going to think that you are like subpar or wrong or bad because you deviate from the stereotype. It's the stereotype that's wrong. But most people, they don't want to... They, they, they don't want to think. They want to just, you know, like, I don't know, paint by numbers. People go through life in a paint by numbers manner. They want everything to be according to the way they want it to be and the way they imagine it, and they don't want the facts to disabuse them of their notions. And nowhere is that more obvious than with Trump. The support for Donald Trump makes absolutely no sense. The man has copied his whole platform primarily from Jeb Bush. And people don't notice that. He condemns George Bush, I mean Jeb Bush everywhere he turns. But he copied his own platform and positions mostly from Jeb Bush if you compare the two Websites. His website versus Jeb Bush. You take tax policy, Veterans Administration, guns, you know, blah, blah, blah. He just copied. Because he came into the race two weeks later. And of all the other candidates who'd been there since January, I think it was Ben Carson who declared himself in January, Trump copied his education position from Ben Carson. He copied his tax policy from Jeb Bush, the gun thing and the Veterans Administration and a couple other things from Bush. Then he copied some things from Cruz, mildly, and then he came up with some goofball positions on China and immigration. It's really weird. And people don't notice. Why? Because they're giving into the stereotype. I'm a businessman. I'm successful. Oh, well, see, he made a lot of money. Therefore, he'd be good in Washington. And yet they hate Washington because Washington is bought by money. So what, Trump's going to be different? You see the problem? He's doing a role model. Now, what I'm trying to get at here is your first big problem in this role model issue is to recognize you gotta, you, you, you're stuck with it. You're stuck with it whether you believe in Christ or not. But because you did, all these role model issues are much more intense. And people are going to look at you, whether you're male, female, white, black, whatever. They're going to assign all these values to you based on those outers, based on stereotypes. And you, of course, are not going to conform to those stereotypes. And they're not going to do their homework. Just like people aren't doing their homework on Trump, they're not going to do their homework on you. They're not going to pay attention to really what you say. They're going to make a snap judgment about you based on outers. And that's a, a burden, a handicap, a, um, an albatross around your neck from the very beginning. One of the problems that I face, for example, to show you the idea, is that it shouldn't matter that a female is posting stuff in the Bible, displaying the Bible, showing its meter. It shouldn't matter that the poster is a female. The only thing that ought to matter is the text of the Bible itself and that you can see what it is and compare its own content for whatever is being contended. Okay, it's like, you know, the sun is in the sky. Okay. It doesn't matter who says that the sun is in the sky. The fact is that the sun is in the sky. But we humans don't like that. We don't want to even pay attention to whether the sun is in the sky. What we want is somebody we like saying whatever they say. And if they say the sun is not in the sky, we're going to go with that because we like the person. But we like a person or dislike a person based on stereotypes. The stereotype for a female is that a female shouldn't be, what do you want to call it, studying Bible and posting it. 
I don't know why that stereotype exists, but it does. So therefore, somebody with, what do you want to call it, credentials, is not going to look at the material. It doesn't matter that, how do you want to call it, maybe God hired a female to do it because it's grunt work, because it really is, to save somebody who's got credentials time in looking at it so he can see what it is, like, you know, assistant secretary kind of function. That doesn't matter because a se because a female posts it, therefore it must be invalid. But it's not. How do you want to put this? It's not an interpretation. It's not a scholastic thing. It's high. Here's the text. Here are the syllable counts. Here's what they add up to. And oh, by the way, all these numbers matter, and they fit to actual dates and you know, timelines in the Bible and in history that you can prove. It's all like, what do you want to call it, objectively verifiable. That doesn't matter. God, I, it's his sense of humor, okay? If I, had, if I was male and I had credentials after my name, even if I posted something garbage about Bible, posted false information, it would have been accepted simply because I would have had the right outers. So I have to wait until God hires somebody who's not going to be, you know, confused by the poster. In other words, God put his word in Balaam's ass. So it doesn't matter if this ass is posting, it matters what the thing, what the ass said. What the ass said came from God. The ass wasn't relevant. This ass isn't relevant. But that's the point. So this is what you face. Is you're going to say something about Bible. And the people who already like you and respect you are going to accept it because you said it. Not because it's true. Not because they understand it. Not even because it's Bible. That's the worst part. They're only going to accept it because you said so. They're not going to investigate it. They're not going to think about it. That's a real sad state. That's a real sad statement about humans. We hate the truth by itself. We will not even listen unless we like the person saying it. So now understand, that's why there's so many different kinds of us. Somebody who respects me would not necessarily be somebody who respects you. Somebody who respects you would not necessarily respect me. Somebody who respects, you know, some establishment type is not going to go for me because I'm anti-establishment. See the point? Everybody's got some kind of prejudice of who they will listen to. And the real sad statement about it, and we're all guilty of this, if you like somebody, you're going to tend to buy what they say without doing your own homework. If you don't like somebody, you're going to tend to discount or discredit or denigrate what they say without doing your homework. But the fact is that the content of what is said is true or not, good or not, bad or not, and the only way to know is to do your homework. And it doesn't matter who says it. If a drunk runs across the street shouting John 3.16 at the top of his lungs, that's Bible. The fact that he's a drunk saying it doesn't make it less true. But if a respectable person goes walking down the street announcing some false doctrine, but he's respectable, everybody's going to buy it. That's why Catholicism is still popular, why Calvinism is still popular, JW, SDA, all the religions, Muslim, Islam, because people like the ones spouting it, not because of the content. So as a role model, that's something you have to understand. 
It's really hard to come to grips with, and I, I don't know if you, I, I don't know if I'll ever come to grips with it. It's really hard for me to come to grips with the fact that I can say something that's straight out of the Bible. All I do is repeat it, and people will call me a liar. I'm saying, uh, look, this is the Bible. It's not me. It's not an opinion. I'm just like the drunk walking across the street citing John 3.16. It's the Bible. It's not me. I'm repeating it. That's all. I'm showing it. I'm repeating it. Oh, but you're a liar. That's your interpretation. No, it's the text. It's not an interpretation. The text says the cat is white. I repeat that text. That's not an interpretation. But they don't like me, so they have to say the text is wrong. That's what they're going to do to you. People who don't like, and what God says in the Bible about it is, don't worry about this. They're mad or, you know, bucking me. They're fighting me, not you. So when you find yourself citing scripture or stating scripture and you know you're stating it accurately... You're in, a, you're in essence repackaging it, maybe. But in, in essence, you're really just repeating it. You can repeat a thing in different words, and it's still got the same meaning. And people will say to you, Well, I don't like that. That's not true. And they'll blame the content on you. But it won't be you. That's what the, it's a kind of a refrain in the Bible. If people object to you, don't worry. It's not you that they're rejecting, it's me. God's saying that to the prophets and all that stuff. God gives you something to say to somebody else, and they reject it, and they blame you when they reject it. But they're not really fighting you. They think they are. But God's saying, look, they're rejecting me and taking it out on you. So as a role model, this is what you live with. There's no way around it. So that's your first problem. Your second problem with being a role model, I alluded to in the last increment, but I need to spend more time on it. The second problem is you look at yourself and you know yourself. Good, bad, indifferent, you know what your warts are. And you don't feel like a role model. And you don't want to be a role model. You're just you. But you're still a role model, just the same. So it's extremely uncomfortable to recognize that you have a role to play vis-a-vis -vis other people. They will put you, you know, put you in little boxes. They will like you and dislike you for whatever their reasons and non-reasons. And at the same time, there is no way you can live up to their expectations. Now, lately I've been really trying to figure out how to deal with that. Because each one of us, if we're honest with ourselves, you look in the mirror and say, gee, I'm a putz. How can anybody look up to me? Okay. And so, and I don't know for sure that this is the right way to do it. But lately I've been thinking, okay, I know I'm a putz. I know humankind is a putz. The big problem we got in Christianity is we're sitting there looking at the Bible, treating all those putzes that are mentioned as if they were, you know, spiritual giants, which they actually were. But when we think spiritual giant, we think that they were sinless, which they weren't. They knew God really well, and that's the definition of spiritual giant. It never means sinless. And some of the most spectacular sins in the Bible are done by mature spiritual giants, like David, Moses... Abraham. Those are the three biggies. David sinned his worst sin when he was a mature believer. He had sex with Bathsheba and then murdered her husband to cover it up. That's pretty bad. Most Christians would say that's bad. And yet God said to David unilaterally, I'm going to have Christ be born from your loins. 
which most people would consider to be high status. David itself, the very word David, means beloved. Wow. My servant David. How many times does God say that in the Old Testament? And this was the kind of guy David was when he was mature. He was actually a better believer when he was younger. Same thing for Moses. Second Meribah, Moses strikes the rock a second time. God punished him for that. He said, you don't get to enter the promised land. That's at the beginning of Deuteronomy. And Moses, even then, even when he's writing it in Scripture, so he's that mature, he's trying to blame the Jews for his own sin. That's what you see him do in the first six chapters. My pastor had a field day covering that. That's how I learned it. He was mature. Abraham, oh yeah, you know, my wife is my sister. When she was pregnant with Isaac. So he was already getting awarded Isaac. He was mature at that point, mature enough to be able to have a son. See, our heroes in the Bible were not um, what Christians would consider good people. So we're not learning the right lessons. We're stereotyping them. We think a role model is somebody, you know, that you should emulate. Well, yeah. But the bigger meaning of role model in the Bible is, hi, this is paradigmal. This is what it's like. Paul. Paul says he was the worst sinner who ever lived. And yet he also says in Philippians, imitate me. Huh? See? Yeah, imitate him because he's human, you're human. He screws up. He even says so in, what was it, Romans uh, 7? I no sooner know the Bible than I want to sin. That's what he's saying there. At the end of the chapter, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God in Christ Jesus. Now there's your role model right there. The role model that you're going to be put into is going to be based on stereotypes. But you can play with that. You can, like, reply to it. Yeah, I'm a role model. I'm a Christian. Role model means, what is it really like to be one? Not some high person on a pedestal who's always, you know, perfect. That's not what it means. A role model. What's a role and what's a model? A model train, a model ship, a model computer is a mock-up. A typical. One that's typical. One that's normal. One that's common. What is a common Christian? And role means how do you play it okay so how do you play it and so what I try to do with people in the comments is I try to like give them snippets of what it's like I don't mince words about yes I'm mature and I screw up all the time that's a model Christian it's a model of what happens to you when you're mature Paul screwed up Abraham screwed up David screwed up Moses screwed up. They were model Christians too. You know, Christ didn't call himself Christ in the Old Testament. They're the same guy. They believed in him. They screwed up. I believe in him. I screw up. You see? So that they can get a hands-on understanding. It's like when your kids are watching you. It's, they, they idolize you at first, but as they get older, they start to realize, oh, this is what it's like, you know, the suffering and the trouble that you go through. They, as they mature, they begin to, like, empathize. And then they begin to realize, oh, this is what fatherhood means. This is what being a dad is. This is what being a friend is. You know what I'm saying? They have to see the warts. Or they will not know how to copy. 
because they're going to have their own warts. They have to know that it's okay to have warts. And so what I try to do, like, you know, I was commenting in Breitbart's a couple of hours ago. And, you know, they were saying, well, you're not a very good Christian when you say blah, 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 blah. And I, and I said, well, okay. Then I need one John, one nine. And sometimes they're wrong in what they said, and sometimes it didn't hurt to allow that maybe they're right. Maybe they were. So they get to see... You know, what is it like? Because I can't pretend I'm not mature. But I can, like, fill it out and show, well, mature doesn't mean that you're perfect. Mature just means you know God. That's all it means. Mature means you know God. That's what it's for. But it doesn't mean that you don't sin. In many ways, you sin worse. You lose the childish sins like sex and drugs or whatever they do in those early days. Okay? You don't do those sins. You got other ones. Like cockiness. Knowing that you know better than they do. Being impatient, which is my worst sin. Losing your temper. That's what Moses did. You know, second Meribah. He lost his temper. In many ways, those are worse. Because you've got the doctrine, they don't have the doctrine. Why are you being so intolerant of those who don't have it? Okay? And you know you're going to fail. So you use your role model that you can't get out of anyhow to like, what do you want to call it? Reveal the warts. And they'll condemn you for it or whatever. But then it's like a release valve. It's like, oh. Because you don't lose your status. You're still the role model. You can't get out of that. You're a Christian. You're a role model forever and ever and ever. There's nothing to stop it. Okay, so now you can regulate the exposure. If they tell you you're wrong, maybe you are. So what does it hurt to admit it? You admit it to God, why don't I admit it to them? Then they learn from your, as it were, mistakes or your warts, real or imagined. So that they can start to learn to tolerate their own. And tolerate it in you. And see you be admitting that's a role model too. Oh yeah, I made a mistake. And they see you not get all flustered about it. They see you not try to hide it and admit it and then they they're going to imitate that it's just like I don't know did you grow up with your parents and your parents did that I mean some of us grew up with really uptight parents and some of us grew up with relaxed parents and those of us who grew up with relaxed parents became relaxed ourselves because we saw our parents make mistakes, be relaxed about their mistakes, admitted their mistakes, no big deal, yeah, I screwed up. Well, I got to fix that, don't I? And then you imitated your own parents seeing them do that, and you too were relaxed. And it was actually quite enjoyable. Whereas if your parents were uptight, you felt that you ought to be uptight too because they're uptight and they did it wrong and they can't admit it so you can't either. That's the point about role modeling as a Christian. You do not want to be an uptight Christian. But 99% of Christianity is uptight. They really are. Everything sets them off. There's no... You know, they can't swear. Oh, you swear, you're a terrible Christian. No, it's just a word. It doesn't usually... Swear words, have you noticed, they really don't normally mean anything. Or when they are, they're really kind of stupid words. You use them, you don't use them. They're just words. Okay? Or some other thing. Like whether your hemline is above your knee or below it. So bleeping what? 
Christians are uptight about everything. Why? Because they don't know what the spiritual life really is. And everybody around them is uptight, so they have no role model to show them their relaxed spiritual life. I would say, if you paid attention to what he wrote, Paul's pretty relaxed. He swears. He uses the what the, some of the scholars are really upset by. He uses coarse language. You know, he's not particularly refined. He's capable of it. But, you know, a lot of times he's just like really brusque or blunt. Not at all Christian by the stereotype. And they cover him up in translation. Okay, they do that with they do that with God too, for that matter. God can be really nasty. Okay, so the relaxed person is flexible. The relaxed person, yeah, yeah, man. Oh, I so I I effed up. Okay, an uptight person can't admit that. But the people around you seeing you admit that, that takes the tension out for them. And so because you, their role model, were relaxed and admitted it, then they can do the same thing. So that's kind of how I like to play it. I'm trying it out. I'm not sure I'm doing it well. But, you know, at times I get nasty with people, and at times I get real, what do you want to call it, pedantic. And at times I just, you know, banter. And then when they call me out or they call me names, it's like, oh, wow, you know, we'll fight with each other. And then they come up with something really clever when they call me a name and I really like it. And I tell them. Or they call me a name and I call them a name and then they say something and it was really funny. And it's as if who cares that we called each other names? It doesn't matter. That sets... That helps them see it's okay to get mad. It's okay to argue. It's okay to insult. And it's never personal and it's never permanent. That sets tones. That helps them navigate relationships, not just with you, but with others. It's like, it's like when you see a Corvette once, then you can spot it the next time. So if you have an inner relationship with somebody and you see they're uptight and you play the relaxed game with them and you insult each other back and forth and joke back and forth, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, they start to let go. And they start to realize, oh, wow, I can, I don't have to be politically correct. It isn't necessary to be politically correct, to be a good Christian. And that releases a lot of tension in their lives. Because look, one way or the other, you're a role model for them. You can play with it and use it to their advantage in yours or not. The trouble with it is that that requires a great deal of thinking on your part about who's listening to you, what's going on in their head, and you have to be talking to God the whole time. But then that's what ruling is. Because once you're ensconced in your throne, in the eternal state, that's what your life is going to be. Now part of me when I say that is like, I don't want to go there. I don't like that future. The other part of me can't live without it. Now maybe you like that. I'm, I, I have a love-hate relationship about this whole doctrine. But it's, it doesn't matter how I feel about it. This is the way it is. And you can just, you know, go talk to God now about it and say, well, you know, brain out, jaw it around for 40 minutes. How much truth is there in this? How much do I need to know? And, and he'll tell you. Okay? Time to do your homework. Bye.